good to be with all of you this evening. Uh, I think we are uh, stretching the technological limits. Uh, uh, they don't just have one microphone on me, they have two. There's this one. Uh, I know that our father hears everything you're saying. Uh, our every thought, but apparently Pastor Tim wants to hear every breath I take here <laughs> as we uh, as we proceed. Also, uh, so so here's here's my understanding of, of this evening. Uh, I'll give a message that will last about an hour, and then we have a half an hour for Q and A. And the Q and A is not limited to anything. If you want to ask me about. Well, how's the work doing in Canada, or how's our church doing in South Africa, or Zambia, or uh, feel free to ask. When I'm going to retire, I might divulge that too. <laughs> so you can ask anything about uh, our church fellowship and what's going on. I even know a lot of stuff about some of the other groups, but uh, I won't answer for that. <laughs> uh, I have just a brief presentation I want to give uh, uh, Bill Wynn his diploma. Oh, wow. Bill graduated from Grace Community Seminary. He's got his master's degree now. He's always been masterful, but now he has the master's diploma to hang on his wall. So Bill, if you want to come up here for a moment, I will give you a hearty hand class. More than that, actually. I want my band. No. <laughs> Not only do I give you this diploma, but uh, Bill's a dear friend. I don't do this for everyone who graduates. <laughs> but I have a 20-year-old Una Hobbit ah. that I brought from Scotland. Oh, just for you. I, I won't say who I am, but there's a Mets fan here tonight. Yes! yes. Uh, Mets, Mets, Mets really, uh, I don't know what the Cubs were thinking. I've, uh, growing up in Chicago, it's one of the few things I, well actually my favorite team are the, uh, the hockey team, the Blackhawks. And uh, the pastor at the time when I was growing up was a guy named Dean Blackwell, if any of you remember Dean. And he had season tickets. And, Nobody else liked hockey, so he would take me, because I did. So I got to go to hockey games all the time. And that, so my team is really the Blackhawks. That's my favorite team from Chicago. But I would go see the White Sox and the Cubs play. And I like both of them. Uh, they both uh, haven't done well lately. Uh, although the Cubs have this hundred-year curse. You know, we've heard the story about the, the guy with the goat. They wouldn't allow him to bring his goat into the game to watch the game. So he pronounced the curse. The Cubs haven't been in the World Series for a hundred years. So it's a, it, it's a true story. Yeah. So uh, true Chicago Cubs fans, they eat roast goat. Kind of break that curse. So. Well, uh, so when uh, Tim asked me to come, I, I don't get to the East Coast enough, so I couldn't turn it down. So I... Uh, I had to come, and I wish that I could stay for the whole time, but uh, I can't. I have to leave tomorrow, and I just have uh, things stacked up. Uh, but uh, at the end of this, the middle of November, I have no more trips for eight weeks. Ah. I get to just be a normal person, go into the office, and sleep in my own time zone. Yeah. Praise God for that. Well, the theme scripture that uh, Tim has for this uh, conference together is 1 John 3, 1. And I think you all know that the Apostle John is sometimes called the Apostle of Love because more than I think any other of uh, the authors in the Bible, he spends a lot of time talking about uh, God being love. And that's the essence of his nature of his being. And of course in 1 John 3, 1 we're told that to see what great love the Father has lavish on us. And I like that word, lavish. He's heaped love upon us. 
that we should be called the children of God. But as you read through the Bible, you find that there are other verses, verses that talk about judgment and condemnation. And it just begs the question, wow, if we're having love lavished upon us, uh, how does that square with all this judgment and condemnation that's coming? And so I entitled my presentation for this evening, Here Comes the Judge. Uh, reminded me of um, an old series with uh, on television, Rowan and Mark and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. used to come dressed like a judge, and you know, sometimes a judge. So I want to talk about that, because judgment is, well, it's not one of my favorite words. I don't know, maybe if you're a judge, it might be your favorite word. But for most people, judgment is just not your favorite word. It's a fair weather, end, fair weather friend to us. If the judgment that you're going to receive is one that suits you and you're happy with, well, then you like the judgment. But if the judgment is against you, well, you're not a fan of judgment. I reminded uh, of a time when, well, this is before I was married uh, to Tammy, and I was living in Phoenix, and I was actually working as a, a pastoral uh, intern. And the pastor that I was uh, sent to to assist was a fellow named Bill Rapp. Uh, for those old timers, you might recall Bill, but he he never really he, he the pastored in Phoenix and was up in Canada a bit. He really never made it to the east side of this country. But he was a he was a good old boy, and uh, he liked playing racquetball. And we would play three or four times a week. And of course, I was 20 years younger than him. <laughs> And so I beat him, and beat him often, and beat him badly. And he'd sometimes play five, six, seven games till. But he was trying to wear me out so he could finally beat me. But being younger and having more energy, it didn't happen very often. But he kept trying. Well, our routine was in the morning to play some racquetball and shower, get our clothes on, and then go do some pastoral visiting. And this. One particular day, we finished playing racquetball, and I happened to be the one to drive that day. Uh, often we went in his car, but this one particular day, I drove. And as we were pulling away from the racquetball courts, uh, we came to a uh, stop sign. I stopped, and I stopped not only because you're supposed to at those you know, stop signs, but across the street facing me, coming the other direction, was a police car. So I'm going to make real sure I stopped to a full stop, right? And it was just then that Pastor Bill and I noticed, because this was Phoenix, and you know in Phoenix, it's, they only have two seasons, hot and hotter. <laughs> and, and I lived there for 12 years, and it, during, during the summer months, oh dear, uh, it'll still be 105 at night. Uh, to survive there, you've got to have air conditioning. Anyway, it's not uncommon that people just walk around in uh, wearing less clothing than you would anywhere else. In fact, you see women wearing bikinis to go shopping and uh, take walks. Uh, I suppose that's a good thing for some people. <laughs> this particular day, when Bill and I pulled up to the stop sign, I happened to look over and here was this young lady wearing a bikini. And uh, she was walking down the street, and uh, of course, there she was, and what, it, it didn't have much on, that bikini was tiny. And I saw a policeman <laughs> looking at her too. And so, obviously, we were sitting there a little bit, <laughs> longer than the three seconds that you need to be at a stop sign, right? And, uh, I proceeded to make a right turn there. I got about half a block up the street and the police car came behind me. And I thought, oh, he must be wanting to chase someone. And I kind of got over and he got over. <laughs> and uh, pretty soon he got on his bullhorn and said, pull over. I thought, what in the world could he be pulling me over for? <laughs> so I rolled down the window and you know, he wants my license and my registration. And I'm saying, well, I'm trying to engage him. Well, officer, uh, What's, uh, what's going on? You know, he wouldn't talk. And I said, well, 
obviously writing a ticket. What are you writing a ticket for? I said, you didn't come to a complete stop what? at the stop sign. And I said, oh, well, we're going to court. Uh, I got a witness here. Didn't face him. Anyway, I, I was perturbed about his judgment. Of this thing. He's, he's writing tickets and he can't see. I mean, I didn't bring up the girl in the bikini at that moment. <laughs> I didn't like his judgment, and nobody likes judgment. And I imagine you can think in your mind of judgments that you didn't like either, that maybe have gone against you. And maybe you can think of some that you liked and were for you. But I think we all understand that there are good and bad judgment. And when it comes to this thing that humans do called sin, sin requires judgment. And I think you would all agree, nobody likes sin. If you're on the, uh, the bad end of the stick when the sin occurs, you don't like it. Uh, and it's funny to think about human nature. When someone sins against you, you would like them to be, well, uh, taken to the full measure of the law. But of course, when you sin against someone else, your carnal mind, my carnal mind, thinks, well, cut me some slack here, you know, I'm just human. That's just the way carnality works. But when I think of sin, in God's view of sin, you have to acknowledge that sin is an ugly and detestable thing. I mean, after all, why does God hate sin? Well, because it hurts His beloved creation. And when I think of ugly and detestable things, to try and, oh, make an analogy between sin and something, the thing that leaps into my mind immediately are cockroaches. <laughs> if you can show this slide there, brother, we'll, uh, I have a picture of some cockroaches. Um, cockroaches are an ugly thing. Uh, there we go. Let's see all my slides at once. Uh, anyone here have cockroaches as a pet growing up? <laughs> Not likely. Not likely. Cockroaches. Not, is there anyone here that thinks cockroaches are something you want to have in your house? No, they are detestable. And if a cockroach isn't detestable enough, consider this. You know, there's a special branch of science called entomology. Scientists who study insects. Now, well, I don't know. I've never wanted to be that when I grow up, but. <laughs> What they have discovered is that there are over 5,000 species of cockroaches. There isn't just one ugly, detestable cockroach, 5,000 different kinds. And if that isn't bad enough on its own, these entomologists discover 40 new species a year. Is there no end to these cockroaches? And of course, in, you remember that movie, uh, Jurassic Park, and they, they found some fossilized amber, and they got some dinosaur DNA out of it. You know, they, they have actually gotten cockroach DNA out of fossilized amber, and dated it to 40 million years old. So cockroaches have been around, well, a long time. <laughs> and these detestable, ugly things are nearly a perfect analogy for sin. On the next slide, and the slide keep just turning off, I don't know why that is. <laughs> because we've got uh, a, a bank of computers and uh, <laughs> 17 speakers. And, but anyway, here we go. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that sin is just like a cockroach? Cockroaches have this amazing ability. They have double jointed legs so that they can run upside down, they can run around corners, and on the pads of their feet, they have these, this kind of a suction cup thing. I, I know it's disgusting to think about because you all see cockroaches, and, and they just run around, they can run upside down on things, any angle, in corners, around corners, they are agile little things. They can run on any surface. And they're actually one of the fastest creatures on God's green earth. Uh, they've been timed. They are among the fastest. 
And the interesting thing about these cockroaches is they hate light. They run away. They crave the darkness. Do you ever have it happen? Uh, you know, I've visited enough people in my day. I remember this. These two blind widows that were members of our Phoenix church, and I would go look after them. And every time I'd come to their house, well, they were blind. They didn't have lights on. And so when I'd come over, the first thing I'd do is turn the light on. Oh, dear. And the roaches were having their own festival of tabernacles. <laughs> And they would run and scurry and, uh, and oh, dear me, I, I was uh, disgusting. Uh, but that's what they do. They run from, from the light. And the fascinating thing about cockroaches is how hardy they are. Do you know, uh, they've done experiments with how hardy these, these, these little creatures can be. And even after they've separated the head from the body, they still live a week long. Not only do they live a week long, they can still lay eggs after their head is been separated. Oh, yeah, it is gross. I hear, I hear you. It is gross. And uh, my wife told me not to talk too long about the cockroaches. When I was preparing this, I was going to show you a little video clip. But my wife said, that's too much. I need to thank Tammy. But they have actually sent cockroaches into outer space. Now, you know, when, when an astronaut goes in outer space, he wears a specially constructed suit, right? You've seen the pictures, you know, to protect them from the extreme uh, heat and cold. And it, it maintained their temperature. It's uh, it, uh, it protected from the, the light that could blind them. Well, when they sent the cockroaches in the capsule, they didn't make little astronaut outfits for the cockroaches. <laughs> they just let the cockroaches be in the vacuum of space. Mm. And, you know, they're up there for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, not a cockroach had died. <laughs> they had lived in the vacuum of space, in the extreme heat and cold, and did just fine. <laughs> I think you can see the analogy here with sin. Just like roaches thrive in dirt and prosper in garbage, so does sin. Just like roaches invade our lives in our homes through small little cracks and crevices, cracks in our defenses, if you will, that's how sin gets in. Yeah. And after hiding, the roaches come out again when you're not paying attention. Just like sin does. And some people deny that they have roaches in their home. Yet, uh, that is how some people are about sin. They deny that they've had or have sin in their lives. And tragically, little roaches grow up to become bigger roaches. And just like little sins and errant thoughts can take on a life of their own and grow up into be, be big sins, I think you get the picture. And I think you understand that's why God hates sin. And on the next slide, I want to talk about, for a moment, the fact that God hates sin. There are plenty of verses in the Bible that directly reveal to us God's hatred for sin. And I jotted a few down here for the slide. Jeremiah 44, 4, oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. Uh, when Jeremiah the prophet uh, spoke to the nation of Israel about their sinning ways, we sent Zechariah. Same deal. You know, that's the history of Israel. Uh, and Zechariah said, God hates a false oath and evil done to one's neighbor. And, I mean, what better illustration can I give than to quote Jesus, who in Revelation said he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So there are plenty of verses, I just cited three to illustrate the point, that God hates the action of sin. He hates what sin does to his beloved creation. But then we reach a point of logic. Because most of the Christian community accepts that. God hates sin. But there are some that reason one step further and say God not only hates the sin, but God 
hates the sinner too. On the next slide, I even jot down a few verses that, well, it seems to be saying that. For example, Psalm 5.5, 5, Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Boy, it sure sounds like that sentence in the psalm is saying God hates the sinner. Psalm 11.5, The one who loves violence, God's soul hates. That sure seems to be saying he hates the sinner there too. Uh, Leviticus 20, 23, 23 uh, Therefore I have abhorred them. A much more passionate word than a simple hate word. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. You know, there's six things God hates. Yea, seven. A false witness who utter lies and one who spreads strife among brothers. And there's a dozen more verses like this. A, a, at least one denomination bases um, their whole doctrine that God hates the sinner on these kinds of verses. Jacob, uh, he loved. Esau, he hated. You see, there are a dozen or so verses that when you read them at first glance, it seems like God hates the sinner too. But how does that then reconcile with God is a being of love, and yet God's going to judge us? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. And for those who think that God hates the sinner, I coined my own term for that. I call that cockroach theology. <laughs> And there are some who believe it, and some who, well, forcefully teach it. And we're going to uh, watch just a one-minute video clip of a, uh, a hyper-Calvinist pastor named Mark Driscoll to illustrate that there are churches, not a lot, but enough, that teach this very thing, that God not only hates sin, but takes it that further step and says that God hates the sinner. So we'll watch that clip. Some of you, God hates you. Some of you, God is sick of you. God is frustrated with you. God is weary by you. God has suffered long enough with you. He doesn't think you're cute. He doesn't think it's funny. He doesn't think your excuse is meritous. He doesn't care if you compare yourself to someone worse than you. He hates them too. <laughs> God hates right now, personally, objectively, hates some of you. <laughs> Yow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, uh, just as a, 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 a point of reference, his congregation uh, fired him. <laughs> he's, he's no longer the pastor there. Their group of elders said, we, look, we can't take this anymore. <laughs> but uh, that's a taste of five-point Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism, as some like to call it. And, uh, and let me take a moment and point out the fundamental errors that are being made in how Scripture is being read and interpreted to come up with such a conclusion. On the next slide, I list, well, the basic three errors that are being committed. Uh, first, it's an egregious misreading of Scripture, it, uh, and I'll explain why it is and show you why it is. Second, it makes the error of atomistic exegesis, and I'll explain what that is and how it's being made a mistake. And then lastly, and equally importantly, is it doesn't acknowledge the very literature or understand the very terms of speech that are being used in the scripture. And so those three errors combine to yield that kind of interpretation that God hates you objectively. And if you think you're doing better than your friend, he hates him too. <laughs> so first let's tackle that uh, the egregious reading of Scripture. On the next slide, I point to Romans 5, verses 6 and 8. And there are a number of Scriptures that I could point to that talk about God's love for His people. 
But notice in Romans 5, Paul writes, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is an important theme that is woven through the entirety of the Bible. That God loves the humanity that he created is the pinnacle of his creation. And his plan was to save them from the beginning. Remember, Jesus was slain from the foundations of the earth. God, when he spoke everything to, into existence, he knew what was going to happen. He knew everything. And he all had it accounted for in his plan. No one slips between his fingers. God is not, as my dad used to like to say, a butterfingers. <laughs> he doesn't drop people. And we see here in this verse, and I could have read more, but I won't, <laughs> that God loves the sinner. Because Paul is telling us Jesus died for us and all of humanity in all our sinfulness. Yes. So that is a major theme of Scripture. And to interpret some of the verses to say God hates the sinner, you end up then with two groups of people. Some that he loves and some that he hates. You see the kind of logic that has to develop there. And behind that logic is the idea that God decreed that from the beginning. A group that he was going to love, a group that he was going to hate. And the reason he had to decree that from the beginning is for God to know everything. He had to make it all be that way. This kind of thinking makes God the author of evil, the author of sin. It makes God a monster. It makes God a respecter of persons. So we know that the major theme of the Bible can't be thwarted. God is love. It's the nature of his being. He died for everyone. So there's something wrong with this interpretation. Which takes us to the next slide. Let me explain what atomistic exegesis is. And I think the best way to explain it is by this old cliche. I know there is a forest in there somewhere. You've all heard that cliche, he doesn't see the forest for the trees. Uh, atomistic exegesis is an over-analysis of little bits of the text that were originally intended to be heard as a whole. And the best way I can illustrate that, perhaps, would be to say, if I were to write a book about my mother, and let's say this is a hundred-page book, and in these hundred pages, I write about how pretty my mother was. Um, I actually have a picture of my mom in her bikini when my dad was dating her. I don't know why that came in. But my mom was beautiful. And uh, my mom had a beautiful voice. Uh, she would often sing special music in church. And, and uh, everyone would ask her to do so frequently. And, uh, but she wasn't a vain woman and she didn't want to always be in the limelight and my mom was very service oriented uh, she was one of the first few deaconesses ordained in our old Chicago church and my mom was constantly taking care of widows and widowers and that's what I saw growing up my mom would put, put us, me and my two sisters in the station wagon, where are we going? Uh, we're going to go over and help this widow and you know, I'd say Again? <laughs> this is cutting into my playtime. But uh, that's the kind of person my mom was. And I would write a hundred pages about all the acts of loving service and how beautiful she was. And perhaps there would be one sentence in this book where I would say she was Greek. And in her Greekness, her nose was slightly bigger uh, than perhaps the uh, size of her face needed. <laughs> now, if you read that book and you read all those sentences on all those hundred pages, would you conclude I thought my mother was ugly? <laughs> Probably not. Unless you suffered from atomistic exegesis and you read that one bit and blew it out of proportion. You see the problem with that. Mm -hmm. That's the second error 
that is being committed to interpret certain verses to say God hates the sinner too. And the third mistake on the next slide is not recognizing the figures of speech that are used in the Bible. Uh, this fellow, uh, he has a funny name, Ethelbert Bullinger, devoted his whole life to chronicling all the uh, figures of speech used in the entirety of the Bible. Man, what an epic work that was. And when I say figures of speech, now, I know that this might be difficult for some, but not all. This will take you back to perhaps fifth or sixth grade, when you learn what synonyms and antonyms and similes and hyperbole, hyperbole, metaphor, any of those terms sound familiar to you? But briefly, let's recap, it's fun. Um, you know, synonyms, you know what those are. Antonyms, you know those are opposites. Uh, now hyperbole, you know, that's just exaggeration. Herbert Armstrong was a master of hyperbole. Uh, he, he acknowledged it. That was his style. Um, so he stated everything in hyperbolic terms. Why? Because he was an advertising man. He's an advertising genius. What do advertisers do? They use hyperbole. This is the best product you can possibly buy. And then how is it hyperbolic? Well, if you use this toothpaste, and you're single, you'll be married in a week. <laughs> Isn't that what the commercials lead you to believe? Uh, if you buy this product, then sexy women are going to come out of the closet. <laughs> you buy this product, ladies, you put this eyelash stuff on, and there'll be a hundred men standing outside your door. <laughs> Hyperbole. Um, my favorite was onomatopoeia. Does that one ring any bells? You know? Ah, but we have an educated group here, I'm pleased. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, euphemisms, you know, you use a polite word in place of a well, not so polite word. Uh, I love I love hyperbole because uh, growing up in this church, I, I became uh, well addicted to it. Uh, my mother would say to me, "I've told you a million times." <laughs> no, she didn't. I would say, "I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse." No, I couldn't. <laughs> Uh, I remember my sister saying, Mom, if you don't buy me this blouse, I think I will die. <laughs> they didn't get the blouse. They're both still alive. <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather. Doubtful. <laughs> simile. Simile, you know, is where we say, uh, I'm as happy as a clam. Fine. I don't know that clams are particularly happy. <laughs> Uh, blind as a bat, you know, bats have a pretty sophisticated system of uh, sonar going on there, radar. Um, snug as a bug in a rug, I don't know how snug bugs are in a rug. Uh, but then we come to this one here called uh, metonymy. And that's the one that I put on the board. It's the important one for these kinds of verses. Metonymy is defined as a figure by which one name or noun is used instead of another, to which it stands in a certain relation. So, for example, uh, when someone says, yeah, the suits are having a meeting. I think most of you understand what that means. You don't think that a bunch of suits came off the rack at Sears. <laughs> And they're, and they're meeting. You, you know what I mean? It's the executives, you know, the brass, or whoever, whatever the term you use, whatever metaphor you might marshal. Uh, someone who's very famous in history for use of metonymy is William Shakespeare. Right? You all recall William Shakespeare? He, he said, uh, uh, friends, uh, country Ro friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. That's metonymy. He didn't mean, okay, take your ear off for a bit, let me have it, right? That would be painful, wouldn't it? Yeah. He said, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> if you're coming at me with your big halbert, and all I have is a pen, I'm running. <laughs> I want something bigger. But you get the meaning. But it also points out the problem. If you don't realize the meaning of the metaphor, whether it's metonymy or simile or whatever metaphor it is, 
you get the wrong meaning. That's the mistake being made with these verses. They're getting the wrong meaning, coupled with the fact that they don't see the forest for the trees because of the atomistic interpretation, coupled with the fact that they're ignoring the major theme of God's love for his creation throughout the scripture. So you see the three errors. You see it's a mistake in interpreting the Bible to say that God also hates the sinner. And that's probably why they fired him. Yeah. They just got tired of that. So, we come to the next point. Well, I, I, I could go on. Maybe I should, because Tim gave me a whole hour. Usually I name this tune 35, 40 minutes. But, you know, when... Uh, when God, when we find verses like in Proverbs 6 where it says God hates the, the tongue that lies, the lying tongue. You know, if you take that literally, I mean God hates the tongue. Right? He still loves you, but he just hates your tongue. What oh, that bad tongue. Or a foot that is quick to shed blood. Oh, that bad foot. Bad foot. You know, clearly, I think you realize it's a misinterpretation. But it, on the next slide leads us to this point because I've been saying God loves us, but yet there's going to be judgment. And so we have to ask, what is this biblical judgment? And as I've studied the scriptures, a fascinating thing I discovered is while you can read about judgment, oh, in a few verses here and a few verses there, when you look at the third chapter of John through the twelfth chapter of John, I was dumbfounded to find there is a whole theme that Jesus gives us about the judgment. If I were to try to make an analogy of that, it, you know when a, a seamstress, a, a man or a woman, sews a hem around the pant leg or on a dress, they use a needle and thread and they just weave that needle and thread throughout the whole hem, right? It holds it in place. Well, the judgment is like a theme that is woven through John chapter 3 to John chapter 12. And you're going to find some fascinating things that our Lord and Savior and King and Elder Brother tells us in John 3 to John 12. And since we don't have time to read all those chapters, I'm just going to hop, skip, and jump through key things Jesus says in the context. But first, on the next slide... Let's look at this word, judgment. And I want you to understand that this word in the Greek is the word krisis. And krisis is translated into English in three ways. And I illustrate that by putting these verses on the board. Um, well, I guess I'm going to read First John, I'm uh, sorry, John 3, 16, 18 first. Because it reiterates what I've been saying. It sort of encapsulates what I've been saying up to this point. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves the world. He loves everyone he created. And that is, you know, survey after survey tells us the best known scripture in the world. The entirety of this planet, when asked, you know a scripture in the Bible? Yeah, which one do you know? For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Best known scripture in the world. I've never seen a survey, and if I were to ever do one, this is the one I would do. What is the least known scripture? And I think it might be verse 17. Because look at what it says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. In the Greek word there is krino. It's the, it's the same word as krisis, only this is the verb form instead of the noun form. And in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So the person who doesn't believe stands in judgment, stands in condemnation. Now, on the next slide, I go to the next verse, John 3, 19, and this is where I want to illustrate this Greek word, krino or krisis depending on whether you want the, the noun or, or the verb. And here we have the noun form, and I took the New International Version to show you how they translate the word crisis. They translate it as, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
So you see the NIV translators rendered the word crisis as verdict. And that is legitimate, and that is correct. But look at the New King James, or, no, I'm sorry, this is the Old King James Version. They took the same word crisis and translated it as the word condemnation. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So same word, but they translated it as condemnation. And there's one more way this word gets translated, which is in the English Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version. You see it there as judgment. So this one Greek word, krisis, can be translated as either verdict, condemnation, or judgment. Legitimate, and you know what? Those are all synonyms. <laughs> can be legitimately translated all three ways. And this gives us a clue as to what the judgment is. But let's press on and go to the next verse. Jesus says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. You know, it's an interesting thought that just came to my mind as I was reading that verse. Uh, throughout my Christian life and my uh, adulthood and ministry, there have been people who are seeking to become more spiritual. And, you know, if you go into a bookstore, there are shelves, there are whole sections of bookstores on spirituality. And people have come up with thousands of ideas how to become more spiritual. Uh, some people, you know, think if you wear a blue crystal, this is going to make you more spiritual. Yeah. Uh, some women think if they don't shave their legs, that will make them more spiritual. Well, I don't think so. Uh, it, weird things people come up Ellen G. White, the uh, famous uh, Seventh-day Adventist prophetess, uh, she, she told women that they shouldn't eat egg, hard-boiled eggs because that hinders their prayers and makes them less spiritual. People come up with strange ideas about what makes you more spiritual. And even in the Christian uh, community, there are whole books written about uh, meditation and all kinds of spiritual activities you can do besides praying and and uh, I'd like to see a book on donating and how donating makes you more spiritual. I don't see books, many books on that. But anyway, the truth of the matter is, to become more spiritual, you live with the thought that we sang today, God knows our every thought. Yeah. How often do we live in the realization that wherever we go, whatever we look at, whatever we think, God's there. You want to become more spiritual? Live in the reality of that thought. You don't need to read another book. Just live in the reality of that thought. That will change your behavior. Now what comes to mind when you hear uh, the word that, or the phrase that we're going to be judged by God? I posed that question on the next slide. And most people that I've talked to, and I've seen others, in fact I uh, there's a video clip I could have used here where the man on the street goes around with a microphone asking people, what do you think of when you hear that you're going to be judged by God? And some people get a little concerned and tense and start to shake a little. But the answer typically is that they see God as some kind of cosmic sheriff. And he's constantly writing tickets on what you're doing. Oh yeah, your time's coming. You're going to be in court, and you know your name is called, and then they wheel in all your tickets. And you know some names will have higher stacks than others. And we see God as this big cosmic sheriff. Uh, recently, I read uh, an in interesting uh, sentence by a fellow named Ricardo Sanchez. He's a Spanish uh, poet, author. But uh, this one sentence he wrote really has stuck with me. And it came to mind because we were in one of these songs we were singing. He said, the devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. You see the identity the devil has for you by your sin. But God knows your sin and calls you 
by your name. Because God gives us a new identity. We're his children. But I think it's fair to say that it's not just the secular world or the unchurched or the lapsed Christians or the nominal Christians that might see God as the cosmic sheriff. Even in the Christian community, you find people who view God as this kind of cosmic sheriff. And uh, that's really not the way God is, as Jesus tells us now in John chapter 5, the next slide. <coughs> Jesus gave them this answer. And of course, you remember the scene that Pharisees were uh, getting on to Jesus' case because he said, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath here. And Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So Jesus is being very candid here about his mission and about God's role in our lives. They're not doing opposite things. As the Torrances like to always put it, uh, Jesus isn't doing something behind the back of the Father. Well, neither is the Holy Spirit, and neither is the Father. They're one in purpose. Their plan is not something they have disagreements in board meetings on and have to vote. <laughs> They're one in agreement. Now, notice what he says in the next verse, verse 22. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. But did you catch what Jesus said? Much of the world, including the Christian community, sees God, the Father, as this cosmic sheriff. And Jesus says, the Father judges no one. Well, I, 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 all, I, all I can say is when I read that, I thought, <coughs> good deal. That's a candid declaration of Jesus I'm going to hold on to. That gives me comfort all the way to the marrow of my bones. The Father has given away his intention to judge. He's given it to the Son, a humble transfer of, uh, transfer of power, if you will, from Father to Son. And uh, it, it can happen certainly because their will is one. They, one's not doing something unexpectedly. The, it, it, they're, whatever the Son does is what the Father wants. So this humble transfer of power is easily seen. Skipping now to John 5, verse 45, Jesus points out an interesting point. He says, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Oh, I like that too. <laughs> wait, wait, stop. There's a period there. I want to stop and just kind of sink and get comfortable in the chair for that sentence. Mm -hmm. The Father's not going to judge me, and Jesus isn't going to accuse me. Man, I'm on that team. <laughs> Aren't you? Yeah. And he goes on to say, your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. Ooh. Yeah. You know, I lived most of my life being a legalist. And I finally woke up one day and said, you know, we keep drawing circles smaller and smaller. Pretty soon I'm going to be the only one in the circle. There's something wrong with this kind of thinking. Now notice, Jesus doesn't stop there. Let me skip ahead just three chapters and prepare to have your mind blown. Listen to what Jesus says in John 8.15. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. Same word in the Greek. That root word, krisis and krino, depending on whether you want the noun or the verb, 
Here it's the singular verb. Oh, my king, my savior, my brother. He says, he doesn't judge anyone. Wow. Love is on our side. Amen. I feel the relationship mm -hmm. when I read this. You know, you hear certain theologians, and I agree with them when they say, God is for us, He's not against us, God is with us. Mm -hmm. When I read this, I feel God is for me and by me and with me. Mm -hmm. He's not my judge. Now notice, in, I'll skip to John chapter 12 on the next slide. And uh, won't read too many more verses after that. But notice what Jesus says. Now is the judgment, that's the Greek word again, Jesus, of this world. When did Jesus say this? Well, he said this back then. Right? The ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So, the verse tells us these two important facts. The now moment of judgment, and that when Jesus is crucified and resurrected and ascended, all people will be drawn to him. And, of course, the adversary will be driven out. Now, of course, in the world in which we live, we see that not everyone is a Christian. Yet. And we see that Satan is still alive and well. And I really like the way Martin Luther uh, put it once. He said, Satan is like a lot roaring lion on a chain. It's a long chain, but Jesus holds the chain. Amen. And that's the way it is now. But eventually, you know where Satan ends up. And uh, he's not going to be able to roam free, uh, even though he's constrained on the chain at this point in time. So we see that there is uh, this judgment, and this judgment has this now tense to it, this present tense, both then and now. Now notice what he says in verses 47 through 50. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. So notice Jesus is being quite clear here. He says he's not going to judge, but there is a word that he spoke that's going to be the judge. For I did not speak of my own accord, he reiterates that, but the Father who sent me commands, commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just, just what the Father has told me to say, reiterating that they're one in mind, in purpose, in will, uh, Jesus is not this cool guy and the Father is this stern old guy. Mm -hmm. No, they're, they're one. Jesus only says what the Father told him to say. Now, let's recap real quickly. Go through a few bullets here on the next slide. Because I feel like I'm doing a uh, one of those late night TV commercials. Uh, Ron Popeil made them famous. If you buy this now, we'll give you two for the same price. <laughs> and if you call in the next ten minutes, we'll add this bonus. I feel this is the technique I'm about to use. <laughs> As I share what we just read, and I'm, I'm trying to be as abundantly clear as I possibly can, the Father will not judge you. And we read that in John 5.22. Okay, the next bullet. The Son will not judge you, which we read in John 5, John 8, and John 12. The next bullet, of course, begs the question, so how and what judges you? And 
the answer? The next slide. Biblically speaking, that word that Jesus spoke is life. Eternal life. And you know when you hear or read uh, Karl Barth or the Torrance Brothers or any number of uh, theologians and they use this term Jesus, we say yes to God's yes or no to God's yes. But some people when confronted with who Jesus is I, I don't understand how they can but they say no. Right? But even though they say no to God's yes I want to give you eternal life they say no God doesn't change his answer. God still wants to give them yes. eternal life. Yes. And C.S. Lewis explains it very nicely in his book, The Great Divorce. I don't know how many of you have ever read that. If you haven't, man, it's good. Uh, and, and people who reject God's forgiveness, reject a relationship with God, and reject His love, they experience God's love as unfair and as, as pain. I don't know what kind of sinning those people have to do to get so twisted that they feel God's love as pain. And I don't know how many people, so don't ask me that question, I don't know how many people are going to, for eternity, reject God's forgiveness and God's love and reject a relationship with Him. I don't know. It seems that there will be a number, a small number, I reckon. I mean, I wonder, uh, you, you've heard of the angry atheist. One of them was a guy named Christopher Hitchens. You know, he died uh, earlier in the year. And I wonder, well, now, I mean, he's been saying no his whole life to God. What's he saying now? I, I don't know. I like to believe he's saying, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd like to believe that, I, but I don't know. But the truth of the matter is, God isn't going to let anyone spoil the cosmic party. God doesn't send anyone to hell. As C.S. Lewis so cogently put it in that book, the hell, door to hell is locked from the inside. These are the people who don't want a relationship with God. They reject His love and forgiveness. And the door is locked from the inside. So, next slide. How does life judge us? The judgment is in your response to the presence of Jesus' life. His merciful, honest, revealing, exposing, forgiving life. Given to you up front without any strings. So, Jesus and the Father don't have to have a courtroom. Uh, they don't have to have... Uh, an attorney for the defense, an attorney for the offense, and make accusations. It is our response. And in that sense, we act as our own judge. We make our own judgment by either accepting Jesus or rejecting Jesus. Now, one uh, really good theologian that I never got to meet before he died. I'm, I'm very jealous of Brother Tim. Uh, Tim got to meet uh, Robert Capon. And in Robert Capon's book on the parables, it's a great book uh, that I heartily recommend. Uh, he, he wrote a book on all the parables of Jesus. And he explained, and let me quote, judgment as portrayed in the parables of Jesus, not to mention the rest of the New Testament, never comes until after acceptance. Grace remains forever the sovereign consideration. The difference between the blessed and the cursed is one thing and one thing only. The blessed accept their acceptance and the cursed reject it. The acceptance is always in place for both groups before either does anything about it. It's a great thought. Beautiful thought. Uh, one more quote I want to uh, come here in conclusion. This is from another theologian named Guthrie. The first thought that comes to Christians when they think about the end of history 
ought not to be anxious or vindictive speculation about who will be in and go up and who will be out and go down. It ought to be the thankful and joyful thought that we may confidently look forward to the time when the will of the world's creator, reconciler, savior, and redeemer will prevail once and for all. When justice will triumph over injustice, love over hatred and greed, peace over hostility, humanity over inhumanity, the kingdom of God over the powers of darkness. The last judgment will not come against, but for the good of the world. That is good news. Not just for Christians, but for everyone. So the judgment isn't something as Christians we need to get a little shaky about and have a little blood flow out of our faces. No. The judgment is something that I now view as this is good. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this phrase that I hear a lot, uh, it's all good. <laughs> You're, you've heard that phrase? Yeah. This is all good. It's good for humanity. It's good for eternity. Mm -hmm. On the next slide, I try to summarize uh, three final thoughts. Judgment is our response to Jesus' life given to us. Second, just provision has been made for everyone to receive the gospel of grace. You know, there's nobody in some cave in Borneo that we have to worry about. He never heard the name of Jesus. Uh, it's, it, everyone has fair and just provision made for them. And third, there will be some who refuse it and alienate themselves from God's kingdom. It seems to be what the Bible indicates, but nobody knows the number. And I believe the Bible is deliberately vague on giving a number and just indicating the possibility. Because I like to believe God wins in the end. I'm a hopeful universalist. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm hopeful that people like Adolf Hitler can see the tragedy of his ways. Yes. I'm hopeful that any mass murderer or any evildoer yes. can have a change of heart and be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way because I know I've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Don't you want everyone to feel that forgiveness? Yes. I certainly do. And I think you do too. So, to conclude my uh, little story I began with up front so I don't leave you hanging. <laughs> Uh, I did go to court with the traffic ticket. And uh, I had Pastor Bill with me because I mean, he was my material witness. And we showed up at the court and, and that courtroom was full for a lot of people who got tickets that were being uh, dealt with that day. And I wasn't the first one to be called. There were oh, probably 10 or 11 that had their case heard before me. And I, I think that was a good thing because uh, I, uh, that was my first time to ever go to court over a traffic ticket. And, uh, and I saw some people uh, try to sweet talk the judge and that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I saw the way some people tried to present their case and I thought, mm, yeah, that's not working for you. <laughs> so then it became my turn. And uh, they called my name and and uh, asked, uh, what do you plead? And I said, I am innocent, sir. <laughs> Had to get just the right amount of righteous indignation in my tone. And, he, and the judge said, so uh, what's your uh, evidence? I said, well, sir, uh, two things. Uh, first, I have a witness in the car with me who will verify that we were sitting at the stop sign for well, at least 30 full seconds. And the reason being, which is my second point of logic, that there was a beautiful woman walking by in a bikini. I gauged her to be in her early 20s. And I think you could ask the officer because I saw him looking at her too. And the judge said, case dismissed. I went out of there with the high hand. I felt pretty good. 
But it got me to thinking because, you know, Satan's the accuser of the brethren. Remember, we've just read Jesus is not the accuser. Yes. And Jesus pronounces us righteous. Yes. We wear his righteous robes. And we don't add one stitch of righteousness to that robe. No. But when I'm wearing his robe, when I'm living in him, mm -hmm. there is no condemnation. Amen. 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 Amen.